Hi, I'm Jim Simavan, and welcome to episode 11 of TTS Talks. We are again welcoming back author and scholar Peter Lavenda, who will be talking about the Secret Machines nonfiction trilogy, along with a variety of other topics dealing with the phenomenon. As always, we do hope our esteemed listeners will find the discussion both enlightening and educational. And for those of you not familiar with TTS Talks, it is a podcast where we take a deep dive into the complexities of our mission here at To The Stars by bringing you one-on-one conversations with the various people who are helping us achieve our goals and who give life to our project here at To The Stars. I'm Jim Semivan, co-founder of TTS and the Vice President of Operations and your host today. I'm a retired CIA operations officer, and I have had a strong interest in and have been a student of what we call the phenomenon for over 45 years. Peter Lavenda will join me again for part three of what will be our three-part and maybe, hopefully, a four-part series discussing Secret Machines, Gods, Man, and War, our trilogy of nonfiction books, which Peter co-authored with Tom DeLonge. Peter is a well-known and highly regarded historian, known for his extensive research in and and knowledge of occultism and occult history. He has an MA in both religious studies and Asian studies from Florida International University and has penned many published works on esoteric subjects. Peter is best known for his book, Unholy Alliance, A History of Nazi Involvement with the Occult and the trilogy, Sinister Forces, A Grimoire of American Political Witchcraft. Peter has also appeared in numerous television programs on the History and Discovery channels as an expert on Nazi Germany, especially on the extreme religious and esoteric ideas that formed the Nazi worldview. Peter, once again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jim. Oh, thank you. Yes. You know, on our last episode, um, we dove into some of the themes of the second book in the uh, Secret Machines nonfiction trilogy, Man, and Due to time constraints, we were not able to finish discussing man completely. And I wanted to jump back into the conversation, if it's okay with you. Um, Now, in our very first conversation uh, together, we chatted a bit about the book Gods, where we discussed the ancient cultural evidence for contact with non-human entities and the religious and spiritual text concerned with, quote unquote, beings from the heavens. And of course, our human relationship with these beings. Now, Getting back to man, in our previous discussion, we look closely at the implications of the UFO, UAP phenomenon, where science is concerned, and your contention that we need to take a multidisciplinary approach to the phenomenon. Now, what I would like to do today is to ask you a few more questions about man that we were not able to go to earlier, and then perhaps ask you some questions that pertain to the phenomenon, though not directly related to the Secret Machines trilogy. And if there is time, perhaps we can discuss the yet unpublished third book in the series, War. I have read the draft manuscript, and I'm looking forward to it being finalized and released by TTS as soon as possible. I know uh, a lot of uh, our audience are eager to see this new book, but there are a lot of exciting things happening with the Secret Machines franchise at the moment and uh, as a whole that that impact determining the best timing for uh, the release of book three. But back to man. A few more questions. Um, Early on in Man, you talked about the assumptions that many of us, the public, had to make uh, and continue having to make regarding UFOs. Um, You stated that uh, since the public was largely denied access to the evidence, they were reduced to interpreting UFOs by themselves. You go on to say, and rightly, I believe, that this relinquishing of authority on behalf of trusted institutions may have served a short-term goal, but in the long term, it has eroded public confidence in the ability of the state to inform, protect, and defend them. Could the U.S. authorities have done better in the early 40s, through the 60s, and even in the 70s uh, on this matter? And, or were they facing an insoluble problem they knew then they could not address appropriately? So in turn, chose to obfuscate and ignore. Yeah, I mean, put yourself in their position. Um, In the late 1940s, uh, we had just been through the Second World War, which was truly a global conflict. We had dropped two atomic bombs, these, these hideous weapons of mass destruction. Plus, we had experienced things like the Holocaust, 
death camps, the Bataan Death March in the Philippines, all these horrible things. And now we had film clips of all of this as well. So people were in their movie theaters watching these things take place, maybe a week or two weeks later, but they were still witnessing it like they never had before, especially those of us in the United States who were not directly involved in the conflict. So we're at home watching these things on movie theaters, on the, on the newsreels, and we're seeing these hideous things taking place. The US government, I think no government on the planet, knew what the phenomenon was. They had no clue. So there's this other problem now. Now we're not only dealing with the aftermath of the Second World War, we're trying to, to mop up what happened in Europe, what happened in Asia. And we're dealing with Japan, we're dealing with Germany. Plus, we're dealing with the Soviet Union, newly empowered, in a sense, to go and do a lot of things that it wanted to do by moving into Eastern Europe. It was the Soviet Union that moved into Berlin that uh, were, the, were the first at Hitler's bunker. So all of this is, is part of what we're experiencing in the late 1940s. The situation is so intense that they created a department of the Air Force, which they didn't have before. They split the Air Force off from, from the Army, on the one hand. They create the National Security Act, right? CIA is created in 1947. All of this stuff is happening at that time. The U.S. government's going nuts, okay? Plus, they're sending a whole bunch of ships down to Antarctica. I don't have a freaking clue what that was all about. Right, right. So all of this stuff is going on, plus... Now there's UFOs to deal with. And there's a 1952, the overflight over Washington, D.C. I think it's hysterical. If you go back and read that press conference that the Air Force had, the newly created F Air Force, is now having a press conference trying to explain UFOs. And they don't have a clue. So they're reduced to talking about biblical images and metaphors, right? They're talking about the paranormal because they don't know what this is. And they're trying, they're showing, they're shoving stuff off in all different directions, hoping something's gonna hit the wall. They're, they're so preoccupied with the Russians getting the bomb and maybe eventually the Chinese getting the bomb that the whole UFO thing is like one more thing to worry about. You know, it's like Joe Pesci and my cousin Vinny. Is there one more thing you can pile on this right now? You know, yeah. so there's the UFO. So what, is, what does the government do? They can explain atomic weapons to a certain extent. They can explain a lot of stuff. They can't explain the UFO. They have no idea what a UFO is. They don't know what it is. They have maybe ideas, maybe they have suspicions, but they have no proof. I think not even after Roswell, whatever the hell Roswell was, there still wasn't enough there to build an entire case. Not trace evidence to sit there and develop an entire picture of what the entire phenomenon was like for the last several thousands of years. So yeah, they, they created a problem in a sense by this obfuscation. Um, they made everybody not trust them. It was an era of distrust. We had J. Edgar Hoover saying that there were communists everywhere, but there was no mafia. You know, nobody was being nobody was being told the truth 100%. There was no transparency. So we lived in a world of constant mistrust, misinformation, disinformation, some of it very deliberate, some of it just accidental through stupidity or through ignorance of what was going on. So I think that that created the environment and the UFO phenomenon we have today grew out of that miasma of data and fear and suspicion and paranoia and the desire to keep the country safe. A, a, a national security mission that overrode everything else. You would agree then that like, you know, when Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex, what we saw after World War II was, well, which we did not have before World War II, was this incredibly powerful military, right? Um, <laughs> these are the people that basically, you know, saved the world um, uh, from fascism and uh, Nazism. And um, now they're back and they have a ton of money and we're getting ready to fight uh, or go to war, a cold war with the, with the Soviet Union. And so they have a lot more power than I think they ever had before. And they just sort of took command no, of this, but I, I think, I, I think you're right. I, you know, I, I don't know how, how did, how did you think that, what did you think about their, their talk about, I mean, when uh, I think it was a Condon report or even project sign early on mentioned it um, the, uh, the idea that um, our communication systems just weren't cut out. Uh, to have all these phone calls being put in and, and chasing, you know, UFOs, whether they were real or not. I mean, does that make sense to you? Or sure, they weren't set up to do it. I mean, we could we could see an incoming missile, right? We 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 had the NORAD was being set up. All of these all of these systems were being set up to deal with this. But 
but something like the, the phenomenon, which just sh- appears out of nowhere and then disappears right away. There's no, there's no chemtrail. There's no trace. There's no nothing. They just show up when they want to and leave when they don't. As long as they were not shooting at us, there was nothing that we, we, were, we were dealing with more immediate threats. That was a threat, but it was more of an existential threat because we didn't know what it was. We had no control over it. We couldn't send ambassadors to its you know, country to tell it to stop screwing around. There was nothing we could do. We didn't know where it was, where it was coming from. Yeah. So there was so much mystery surrounding it that there was, everybody was at a loss. How do we, how do we deal with this? And yeah. bringing up the, the military industrial complex is, 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 is spot on also because who's the guy who actually told the United States, we, have, we need a military industrial complex? And that was Theodore von Karman. And that takes us back to a whole host of issues with Jack Parsons and with, you know, weirdness and all the other stuff and uh, paranoia regarding the Soviet Union, paranoia regarding communism and all the rest of it. Von Karman had gone to Germany, saw what the Nazis had done, had creating a total war environment. And he came back and told Pap Arnold, uh, Hap Arnold, he said, you know, we need the same thing. We need what they have. You know, they had a total war apparatus. We need the same thing here. We need a military industrial complex. And this was the guy who actually came and said, this is what we need to do. We need to do it right away. And that took precedence over virtually everything else. Yeah, yeah, I see. Now, you know, after the war, um, most most countries, you know, um, most Axis countries were sort of basket cases. But but China, you know, falls into that category, too, even though, uh, you know, they had a different um, uh different participation, just different participatory role in the war. But what about the Soviet Union? We knew they were experiencing the same issues regarding UFOs during the early 40s and 50s. What was the USSR response? And was a difference in the US response in any way? Or did yeah. anybody uh, you know, have a different response in reading? Yeah, I, I get into that a bit in uh, the third volume in war, just to tease that out for a while. There's a couple of chapters just on the Soviet Union and its response. and um, Without going into too much detail, initially, their public response to their, their official response, the Pravda, you know, is the, 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 the kind of official uh, Soviet response to it was, it's nonsense, or it's the United States screwing with us. I mean, they had two different ways of looking at it. It's not from outer space, forget that, there's millions, nothing like that. If you're seeing UFOs, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a program by the United States. It's secret weapons the United States is developing. And that was their official response in the 40s and 50s to the UFO hysteria that was starting in the United States. The Russians were saying, this is like some propaganda to make us feel frightened. Uh, they're trying to intimidate us. This is not, you know, it's not an alien thing that we have to worry about. That was the official response. Unofficially, they were as concerned as the United States was, uh, possibly more so. Uh, the same thing in China. There was a growing awareness in China as well, even under Mao in the in the early years, that something was happening uh, that they didn't they couldn't put their finger on. Uh, the Chinese had a kind of cultural attitude, which is a little different from the Soviets, but it, it generally it amounted to the same thing. There was something fishy going on. Maybe it's the Russians. Maybe it's the Americans. Maybe it's a secret weapon. And just as we thought, maybe these were Russian secret weapons. Maybe this was a Nazi secret weapon because the Nazis had been working on prototypes of what we would call a flying saucer, the famous Horton brothers and all of that. So a lot of that technology wound up in the Soviet Union. So uh, we like to talk about paperclip, which we brought thousands of Nazi scientists over here, but the Soviets had their share. They had thousands and thousands of of, uh, Nazi scientists that they apprehended, uh, including their families and everything else. They brought everybody in. And they were working on the Horton prototypes and other, other sort of flying saucer type uh, vehicles themselves. So we knew this and they knew what we were doing. And there was a suspicion that both sides are using Nazi scientists to try to attack the other side. Right. So it was a mess. I mean, it, it, there was no clear mission statement where UFOs was concerned. Nobody knew. We suspected the other side of doing nefarious things. There's even you know, rumors that Roswell was you know, based on some kind of secret Nazi technology. Uh, yeah, so there was all of this floating around. So yeah, the, the, the Soviets officially poo-pooed the idea, if there's UFOs, it could be uh, an American secret weapon. Privately, they were concerned. And they became more concerned as the 60s and 70s progressed 
and their, their nuclear bases were getting screwed with by, the, by UFO sightings. Now, uh, in chapter three, you said, you asked a question, why do angels and aliens have no knees? Which I thought was rather <laughs> odd until, until I read on. And I'm asking you this because I found your comparisons of angels and aliens in, in man uh, really fascinating. Uh, now, I know Tom Bullard, uh, Thomas Bullard, he's a noted anthropologist. And of course, you know, our own Jacques Vallée discussed the similarities between both religious and cultural entities throughout history. So could we be looking at the phenomenon through different lenses, but essentially seeing the same thing? Yeah, I think that that we're on the right track if we at least open our minds to that possibility. Um, I think it was C.D.B. Bryan who was talking about, uh, one of his books, he was talking about a UFO convention somewhere and presentations that were being made and discussing the anatomy of the aliens. Right. And he brought up the fact that, you know, the aliens have no needs, no needs. They have no reproductive organs either that we can find. <laughs> And uh, they're missing some other equipment as well. And, but for some reason, they have no needs. And that struck with me because from my religious studies background, uh, especially in Christianity and Christian ideas about angels, angels have no needs because they are constantly standing because you don't sit in the presence of God. And the angels are always in the presence of God 24-7. They are perennially in the presence so they don't sit, you know, they don't chill out when, when God is around and God is always around for the angels. That's like your boss is at work constantly looking over your shoulder, right? So you're, you pay attention. So the angels do not sit because they do not sit. They have no needs. They have no need of needs. Uh, and depictions of angels in iconography going back a thousand years or more show angels wearing robes covering that part of their anatomy. So we, there's, no, there's no concept of an angel sitting down and hanging out. They're always in motion and they're always standing. Um, so there was this, this idea, this is like, this is odd. You know, I can see, okay, the angel has to be in the presence of God. They're always standing. But wouldn't an angel walk and wouldn't they need knees to walk? But the, the tradition is no, they have no knees. I mean, it's in Jewish right, mysticism right. as well. So, okay, well, that's, that's a bizarre little factoid that just sits there and just, you can't digest it because Aliens have no knees and neither do the angels. Are we looking at the same entity? Are we looking at, if not the same entity, is something happening that we're reacting to this way? No knees, could it mean something deeper than that? Is it not just that there's no knees, but again, there's no reproductive organs, angels don't reproduce. Um, so there's there's that aspect as well. There's They're not quite like us, and yet they kind of look like us. They appear with faces. They appear with heads, they appear with, with arms, and they communicate, which is pretty much like aliens, the, the popular conception of aliens, the, well, the accounts the, of alien abductees. Well, who, who, in your opinion, who are the Nephilim who came down and, you know, and sort of took on uh, human wives and, and what have you? They clearly weren't androgynous and, or sexless. And then, you know, you have the angels wrestling with, was it? Jacob, no, I can't remember who it was in the Bible. Right, Jacob, Jacob's ladder. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, you know, it's 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 very confusing. Um, but um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I I know Jock said, and I, I don't know whether it was, I think it was in Revelations, or it could have been in uh in his second book of his trilogy, that um, you know, it's uh, you know what we're view, what we're seeing now is 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 pretty much the same thing as what what people right. saw in 16th, 17th, 18th century, you know, Celtic um, and, and British um, um, history. Uh, it's almost the same, uh, the same type of images and people and what have you, fairies. And the difference is we, we, in those days, they developed stories to explain it, right? right? Today, because of our scientific apparatus, we're, we can't get away with that as easily, you know, because now we have, you know, video. Now we have people that are, you know, military people, intelligence people, and scientists who are coming out and saying, no, this stuff exists, it's real. When it was just angels and demons, when it was fairyland in the, in the Celtic lore and all the rest of it, you can kind of say, well, people are superstitious, or they're projecting images on something that isn't there, or it's a metaphor for something, or it's an allegory about something else. But now it's on tape, right? So now we're stuck saying, well, we can't use the same stories, but we've got to look back at those stories and see what are the common characteristics. Maybe, maybe there's information there. And I'm 100% I'm sure there is. 
and not just in, in you know, European or American, but the world has experienced this. And everybody has a take on it. And I think we've got to go back at all of this and look at it from the point of view that this is evidence of something that actually happened or happens or is happening on a regular basis. Go back and look at the cultural lenses and try to figure out what are the common characteristics. And one of them is the angels have no knees. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> now, uh, during a discussion uh, about, uh, and this was in chapter four, when we were discussing, you were discussing the origin of the species, you um, uh, talked about um, our collective human situation on the planet you know, uh, our similar memories, uh, our reactions to nature are all pretty common. And you stated, I, I thought rather poetically, you said something happened to put us here on this planet. In order to find out what it was, we have to understand who we are. And once we understand who we are, we can begin to figure out who they are. And my question to you is, uh, can we actually do either? Well, I think we have to. I think if we want to solve this problem, I think the problem of the phenomenon is our problem. I mean, it's not just a, something that's happening out there. It's not just something that's that's remote from us. This is something that might be central to who we are right. because it's, it's a blind spot that we have. You know, it, it's something that we try to ignore. We build up this beautiful sort of idea of what reality is. And like Robin Williams used to say, reality, what a concept. I mean, it's, it's something that we've invented for ourselves to enable us to survive, to exist, to procreate. Um, but it doesn't answer all of our questions. I think right. Genesis in the Bible, you talked about the Nephilim, sons of God and daughters of men. That was just immediately before the story of Noah and the ark and God just destroying the entire world with the flood. Um, Genesis may be just an attempt of us trying to come to terms with who we are. And as we did that, we came up with this idea based on ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian myths that humans were created as machines. Humans were created as, as, a, as a, basically a slave race uh, to sit there and, and to support the gods who created them. We were created beings. We were artificially made. And that, that thing haunts us. It's always with us. It, it kind of explains why we're on this planet and we don't feel at home here. We trash it, you know. We, we don't really feel like we belong here. We feel alienated. And there's a, there's a movie that Alan Arkin made 150 years ago. Um, well, a long time ago anyway. It's called Simon. And there's a, there's a, he, he plays a, a, a mental patient who believes that he comes from another planet. That's his, that's the shtick of the, that's the whole thing. Uh, I, I, I remember that movie, yes. You do, that's, that makes two. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's a great line in there. He's talking to a psychiatrist and he says, of course, I'm alienated. I'm an alien. <laughs> and I think to myself that phrase all the time, you know, are we alienated because we're aliens? Are we alienated because we feel that we've been artificially constructed? Going back to the, to the aliens and the angels with no knees, are they machines? Are we machines, right? What, what constitutes being a machine? The whole theme of the trilogy is secret machines. Where do we draw the line between the machine in the sky and the machine here? Are we also as much a machine as it is? And is this why we, we're blinded to this? We're, we're trying to avoid confronting some very serious, um, how should we put it, a kind of trauma, maybe, that we have embedded in our consciousness, uh, which takes us far, far afield from the questions you have, I know, but this is just something that, uh, that we struggle with. We need to understand what they are to understand what we are. I think there's a, a reciprocal kind of a, a relationship here. And I think this is, the, this is the blind spot. We've been creating you know, ideas of reality in our science um, and there's still a blind spot in our science. We can't fit all the laws of science together in a way that makes sense to us in a way that we can predict outcomes yet. We're, in fact, we've just come up with a new, a new force. We have the four forces, right? Strong, weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, gravity. That's not enough. Now scientists are proposing the symmetron. They're proposing a fifth force, which would help to explain all the stuff that's missing from our equations for the four forces, you know, a kind of unified field theory that we've been searching for. We keep going and circling around and circling around something that keeps avoiding us, that we keep missing. And the UFO may very well be that missing piece. 
it's telling us something, whether deliberately or accidentally, but the mere fact that it exists prompts us, asks us, demands us to ask some very serious existential questions. And it's not does that UFO come from Mars. It, it's something much deeper than that. Even if it did come from Mars, that's already a big problem. But is there something even deeper? Is it trying to tell us something deeper that's been here for thousands of years doing the same silly stuff, appearing, right. abducting, saying weird things, uh, threatening us with extinction and all the rest of it? Isn't there something very serious, something core to the human psyche that this represents? The thing that always puzzled me about the phenomenon was, you know, whatever it is, whatever the big reason is we're here, we're, we're not given an instruction manual. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, science is our, and religion is our attempt to figure out how to create order and figure out who we are, right? And, um, um, I, you know, I, I, people always take it upon themselves to say, we got to devote more time, we got to devote more time to figuring out what this thing is. And, and my contention has always been, well, hell, it would be nice if the phenomenon helped us out a little bit, if it would just come in one day and say, hey, look, no, no more screwing around, no more bullshitting you guys. Here, here's a couple of good things you can rely on that are actually true, but we don't get that. But We don't get it because we have to do that work. It's yeah. up to us to do yeah, that. Right. That's the problem. That's yeah. the whole point. If they came in and told us, well, you know, that's it. That's all she wrote. The whole purpose is for us to find, to answer those questions. It can't answer it for us. You know, that's like going to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, "Well, this is your problem. Okay, give me a hundred bucks and go away." It doesn't work like that, right? It doesn't make you feel any better being told exactly what it is. You know, you got to go through the therapy. It's got to take like 20, 30 years. You know, and you know, if you die before you, you know, you pay up. You got to, you know, you still have to pay for the sessions you missed. I don't know it's a Woody Allen story. Anyway. This is the problem. We have to do this ourselves. This this is the whole point. The whole point is to answer that question. Once we yeah. answer it, everything falls into place. Yeah. See, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, and, and, and I mean, I, I think that's what's going on. No that's what's going on. Yeah. That's what's going on. That's not something I like, and and uh, I I don't think it's fair. Let's put it that way. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, not. it's just does not fair. But that's that's a whole other ball game. We can spend an hour on. Let me let me jump to something else and um. um early on in man, you were discussing the dual nature of the phenomenon and how it was portrayed in films and how it may have mirrored the turbulent political situation in the U S at the time. Um, I'm speaking of the sixties or the eighties. Now you asked the question, how much of this was due to some kind of psychological dysfunction in the American psyche and how much had a more, and how much had a more tangible origin in the UFO phenomenon itself? Um, could we be experiencing, in so in your viewpoint, some kind of collective nervous breakdown? What Young referred to as would have referred to as psychic disequilibrium. Uh, in other words, he he put up this proposition that all this stuff is is it could be just our collective unconscious, you know, just very upset, uh, not knowing, stressed out over the nuclear situation, and everything else, and this is just. Our collective unconscious is coming out and manifesting these things, these, these UFOs and UAPs. I, I don't think it did enough credit to the whole thing in general, because I think it's a lot more than UFOs and UAPs. But what, what did you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you as well on this. This is, you would have been, you know, a bit more uh, credible on this if he had accepted the fact that this phenomenon goes back thousands of years. Uh, if he's only looking at it as like this is a modern phenomenon, which is how he wrote Flying Saucers, uh, his, his little treatise on Flying Saucers was that this was, you know, kind of a modern thing representing our the stress that we've gone through and psychic disequilibrium, as you said. Um, I think that's how we're reacting to it in, in the 20th to the 21st century, perhaps. But that's not what the phenomenon is. It's just a convenient placeholder now for all of this, right, for what Jung was talking about. I think, though, he's coming close to uh, uh, an explanation for it, as Jung always does. He's he always gets a kind of close to the what's really going on, whether it's alchemy or anything else. He kind of gets close to it, and I think he's afraid of going all the way in. But in the case of the UFO phenomenon, I think we know from psychology that childhood trauma, you know, real real trauma, tends to lead to dissociative episodes, to dissociation. If the phenomenon itself was an instance of trauma in our past, as I've kind of suggested in the, in the trilogy, that 
you know, the whole cargo cult idea there, that something had happened which suddenly caused us all to have this collective nervous breakdown and to, you know, zealously attempt to find out about space travel and immortality, like running parallel in ancient cultures, going to the stars and, be, and becoming immortal. This idea of getting off the planet and living forever, but someplace else. Right. Um, this, this idea might have been the, the result of a kind of a collective childhood trauma that we've, we've gone through, a kind of dissociative episode. And the reason why we don't understand it, I think, is um, similar to the way we think that um, we don't really trust our memories to be real because they're not. Um, we remember things the way we want to. We amend those memories with new information or there's information we don't like, we take it out. It goes back to the trauma thing of trying to disguise and cloak uh, experiences we've had and make them sound more palatable or trying to paint them in a different picture, which means that we live, we live our whole lives with a backstory that's constantly being rewritten, you know? We're like in the Marvel Comics universe here, you know? We are just rewriting the characters, you know, motivations, and we're trying to figure out the other characters, and we're creating new worlds and new ver universes for them because one isn't enough. And we're doing this to ourselves all the time. And I think if we can't trust our own individual memories, how do we trust our memory? How do we trust what we understand to be reality? We're constantly amending what we experienced even a day ago, not to mention 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. So we're dealing with, you know, we're not playing with the full deck. And as I said in Secret Machines, I think it was in the second volume in Man, we're playing solitaire, but there's a joker in the deck. One of those 52 cards is not what it should be. And that's why we can never win the damn game, right? The Joker is always there. It's like that old song playing solitaire till dawn with the deck of 51. You can't really win the game. The Joker is in there. Until we address the Joker and rearrange our game around the Joker, we're never going to win a game of solitaire. Well, and, well, I, well, let me throw this out because this is a, this is an excellent point you're making here. How does this how does this relate to the fact that that these people who have contact experiences are spoken to by the entities, these entities that come in, whether they're their bedroom or they're on a ship or, or what have you. And they feed them, you know, essentially lies. Um, some, some, there's some truth, I think I'm sure of it, Sarah, but, uh, but uh, essentially they just feed stuff to them. And we don't know what we're getting uh, with, during these contact experience. People don't know. They come out with a story, but we don't know if that story is real. What does that have to do with this? Or is it the same thing? It's it's basically the same thing. I mean, my experience, um, you know, my experience has been more on the paranormal side. Yeah, I've studied esotericism for decades and decades. They also lie. These these paranormal whatever entities oh, you want yeah. to call them, they yeah. lie, they lie like rugs. I mean, they're they're just constantly telling you stuff that is yeah. definitely not true. You know, and is it is it a test? Is it an exercise? You know. Are you being given a series a series of math questions and you've got to figure out which ones are right and which ones are wrong? You've got to prove right. your answer. Is right. that what this is all about? Is this is this a an exercise they're putting you through? Again, that implies deliberation. It implies um, somebody doing this deliberately to you. Or is this just what they do, right? Is Do they just say stuff? Do they just communicate stuff? that they think you want to hear, or do, do they pick things out of your own brain, out of your own memories, and rearrange all of that stuff and give it back to you? Is that what's going on? Again, until we know who we are, we can't, we can't figure out who they are. Yeah. And in order to figure out who they are, we've got to work more on ourselves. This is the only way this is going to work. We have to be strong in our lying to say, and wait, say, wait a minute, you're lying. This is not true. But nobody does that, right? Nobody tells the aliens, shut up and leave me alone, right? The experience is too overwhelming you are you are you lose all your volatility, your 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 ability to do anything, and you just sit there and take whatever happens. Right? There is no like aggressive stance towards these beings, and the the ancient, um, not even that ancient, but the occultists and the magicians and the people of of, of ancient times, they develop strategies for commanding and controlling that experience. They knew that was what was really important. So they had to prepare each individual person to be able to withstand the onslaught of the nonsense they would get. You know, if you read the old grimoires, 
since we talk about grimoires, the grimoire of American political witchcraft. If you look at the old grimoires, they're full of, of exhortations, you know, to the spirit, appear in this form, talk to me correctly, say the truth or else, you know, you'll be destroyed or I'll burn you with this wand or sword or something. What's important is the understanding that dealing with these entities, dealing with what we might call the phenomenon, is a dangerous process. And you have to be on your on, on your toes. You have to be in your best A game to deal with this. If you're not, you're going to be uh, battled back and forth uh, like, like like a, a badminton. Uh, you know, it's just it's it's incredible that the damage that can be that can happen. The problem that I have when I'm saying stuff like this is it sounds you know totally like we're paranoid that the phenomenon is something to be afraid of. Not exactly. The phenomenon is a test. Let's look at it from that point of view. Something that we should rise to something that we should rise to dealing with and not run away from. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you then, uh, what would what would the average person do to get to know themselves better? I mean, are we talking about um, initiation experiences, you know, regarding Western mystical tradition, or are you talking about meditation, or are you talking about, uh, uh, you know, something totally different, therapy, how do we get to know ourselves? And and I and I and I know it, it's a rather broad I think the question. The start is reading. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, seriously. Yeah. Uh, no, it's fine. Yeah, Secret Machines, volumes one, two, and perhaps three. Um, I think. Or is it a personal uh, thing? People decide for themselves. It's definitely or... has to be. It's it's very it's personal. It's interior. Um, in writing about in modern days, writing about. The whole realm of the paranormal. Uh, a famous author, Israel Regardie, uh, said nobody should deal with the paranormal at all until they've had at least a year of therapy. Right. The idea is to find out what you have to work on, where your strengths and weaknesses are first. Uh, try to figure that out. If if not through you know meditation or yoga or something like that, which is dangerous these days. There's so many fake schools or people who are trying to you know. Uh, uh, take advantage of people and take advantage of them financially or otherwise. But just to go through a, a period of self-reflection, honest self-reflection to see if you can find out what is making you tick, where your weaknesses are, what you're afraid of. That's really what you have to do. Even something as seemingly unrelated to this conversation as Mozart's magic flute opera. Even that is an initiatory experience. That tells you a lot about what to expect. Because there's a scene in Magic Flute where the, the hero approaches the gate to the to initiation, let's say. And there are these huge, horrible, demonic figures standing in front, guarding the, guarding the way. The evil that you see, the hideousness, the horror that you see is mirrored, is only a mirror of what's inside of you. Once you realize that, these demonic beings turn around, they're just regular guys, right? And they open the door and they let you in. But there's going to be a point at which you're going to be very frightened of what you see. And it's not out there, you know, it's, it's internal. And that's, that's the, a helpful thing to experience if you're ready for that. We're really going off into other areas here, aren't we? No, no but we're supposed to. And, and yeah. um, so you're talking about really getting to a point of what, what some people would call higher humanity. In other words, developing yourself internally, philosophically, spiritually to a point where you're more uh, open-minded, compassionate, yep. understanding, mm-hmm. things along those lines. Yeah. Okay. And, and you yeah. see that sometimes, right? right. With, with people who've had these experiences, they their whole yeah. life becomes altered and changed and uh, most often for the better. Absolutely, it does. And it's an initiatory experience that way. That's what an initiatory experience is like. You come out on the other side of it and you're a changed person. You're more capable. You're more uh, powerful in, in the world, which is like a a local benefit, not not a general benefit for all of humanity, but it is a picture of what could happen if we as a people decided we want to find out what this is. We are, we are willing, able, and uh, ready to understand what the phenomenon is. I'm not trying to make the phenomenon as just nothing but an initiatory experience. It's a lot deeper than that. And we're using words without really explaining what they mean. Exactly. Which is one of those yeah. things that really bothers me. We're taking things out of context. But I think people listening to this are getting basically the idea of what of what we intend. Although don't quote me individually and start nitpicking because I know you will, Twitterverse. Yeah. But you know, I'm just telling you this is we're speaking in general terms here. But we we do dissociate in the face of things we don't understand. We freak out. 
you know, something happens, we don't know where to put it, and we either try to ignore it completely and try to forget about it like it didn't happen, or we obsess about it to the exclusion of everything else. And both of those paths are wrong. You know, we have to find a way to balance it to delve more deeply into what it might mean for us. Right. Experiencing the phenomenon requires us to be a bit more creative about how we manage that particular memory, because that memory can become clouded and misshapen, as we know, with the passage of time, where now it suddenly it doesn't mean anything anymore. And that happens a lot. So we're at the point now, though, with technology where these things don't disappear. They're still there. They're on videotape forever. And yeah. the, the statements of people who witnessed it stay forever. So we're now being forced to look at this, whereas earlier days we could kind of ignore it. And we wouldn't see a UFO anymore, and we didn't have to worry about it. Now they're right there. They're front and center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just it's really an interesting time. There's, there's no, no question about it. Uh, and I, th I think one of the first things, I mean, somebody once asked me, what do we need to do? And I said, we need to create a private agency or a private organization with you know, adequate funding, sustained adequate funding, uh, without any expectation of quarterly reports, because this, this is too too difficult to do, but but nevertheless establish uh, you know a common lexicon uh, uh, that we can all you know, you know talk with. So I mean, because your point earlier about you know we're we're throwing around terms, this even like the phenomenon itself, and we're not really we're not able, I don't think, to explain exactly what it is in, in total detail. But but well, you know, I, I ha we haven't exhausted all the questions from man, and you know, I probably have dozens more. Because uh, I was going through the book and, you know, just, you know, furiously writing down notes in the margins and what have you. Um, but let's um, let's talk. Let's go off script just for a few minutes. And we were sort of went off script here a little bit, too, because uh, I really wanted to ask you uh, some more general questions about the phenomena, given that you're such a keen observer um, and you've written extensively uh, about it in both fiction and nonfiction. Of course, you're very widely read on the topic. And other topics, and um, and I think our listeners would like to hear what you have to say about a lot of this. Um, both of us have read a lot. You've read far more than I have, uh, and far more deeply than I have. Um, uh, but be, but be, before I have <laughs> some questions, I have lined up. But but before we do that, I, I just wanted to go current on you just for a second. Um, uh, a few days ago, you know, uh, we saw uh, a report. Uh, Leslie Kane sent me a note, you know, saying, "Look, this this was on the front page of the New York Times, basically saying, you know, Congress wasn't all that happy uh, with what they've seen from the UAP task force um, because essentially what they were just getting is, oh, here's some more UFOs or UAPs that have been appearing, and um, and, and gee, we can't explain them." And that is exactly uh, what they want to hear, but they also want to hear a hell of a lot more than that. And uh, particularly the Gillibrand uh, uh, people and the and Marco Rubio in particular, I think they're not satisfied with what they've been receiving. Um, I myself, you know, you, you talk to task force people and, uh, you know, and, you know, I mean, rightfully in a, in a way, I mean, the UAP task force, the government version of it is concerned primarily with national security. But as you know, as well as I do, national security, once you get into this, that's a very, very small uh, portion of this because you're getting into all kinds of other stuff. And I just want to I just want to get your reaction to all of that and, and what you think, for instance, that, uh, if you if you were uh, running the UAP task force, what's the first thing you would do? I mean, how much would you include in this? I mean, obviously, you talked about earlier about the national security aspect, the nuts and bolts. I mean, what are these things? Are they going to cause us? Are they an existential threat? Are they going to cause us problems? But once you've yeah. looked at that and you realize, holy cow, there might not be any there there, where do you go? Because we're defining national security right now in terms of the physical plant, right? right. We're defining national security in terms of our borders, our buildings, our installations, our military uh, our energy plants and all the rest of it. That's how we define national security. We've got to broaden the, the definition of national security to include psychology, the psychological ramifications of things that are going on. We have to include it. I don't want to sound airy and fairy about this, you know, but we have to include other dimensions other than the purely physical because if our psyches are massaged by an alien force, whether it's an alien alien force or some other country, it's still a damage to the national security. If we all start believing weird things, that's a damage to national security. If we start um, 
uh, we're all getting haunted by ghosts. It's massive damage to national security. National security is something that we have to now broaden the definition. It was easier before. We defended our borders. That was it, right? But now our borders extend into space. It extends into the cyber realm. That's also national security, which means that information has become a, a national security con uh, uh, concept. All of this now comes under national security. And the phenomenon is touching on all of these. The phenomenon starts with the threat to the physical base, the physical plant of the United States, right? It can fly over a nuclear power plant and turn it off. It can fly over uh, a missile base and turn it off. It can bother our, our pilots over the Nimitz in the middle of the ocean. It doesn't matter where we are. It can screw with us physically. But as it's doing that, it's also screwing with us psychologically because we don't know what it is. We don't know how to deal with it. And some of the stuff that it does defies not just physical laws as we understand them, but they're also anticipating our movements, anticipating what we're going to do. They're screwing with us deliberately by turning off our missile defense systems at critical junctures and then waiting around for a while, then turning it all back on again. What the hell is that, right? Right. So the threat to national security is not just the missile bases. It's, the, it's what is doing this and how it's affecting us psychologically. So we have to extend this to include more than the nuts and bolts people. The nuts and bolts people are crucial to understanding this, but just as crucially, we need people who are versed in the psychological aspects of our culture, the psychological aspects of defense in order to understand this. A UAP task force has to be more than just trying to analyze the video. We've got to figure out how it was during the Nimitz case that the phenomenon, those Tic Tacs were able to assemble at a CAP that was not predetermined, that was determined on the spot by a computer on board the ship, how they knew where our, our planes were supposed to, to, to gather, what point in the middle of the sky they were supposed to rendezvous, how did the Tic Tacs know in advance where that was going to be? That's the part that spooks me out more than anything else the pilots recounted, more than the shape, the size, the flight characteristics, what really bothered me was how the hell did they know where they were supposed to be yeah, before yeah. the computer did, sure. right? That's, that scares me, okay? So we have to understand national security from that point of view, because if they could do that, we know they can do a hell of a lot more. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent point, Peter. Um, I know John Alexander talks about the precognitive ability of the of the phenomenon, or the seeming pre precognitive ability, yeah. and uh, it was the reason why you know CIA and the military were so interested in remote viewing. You know, right. it was accurate. You know, if you were a good remote viewer, you're accurate eighty percent of the time. If you were a lousy oh, wow. remote viewer, maybe you're accurate, you know, twenty or thirty percent of the time. But it did work, and it it, it was significant. So. But let me let me let me go into another area here. Um, you know, I, I I I'm in I was in the process about a month ago of rereading all of John Keel, and I recommend um, I recommend a lot of books. Uh, but but Keel's you know early early books, you know, Operation Trojan Horse and Disneyland of the Gods, and um, you know, The Eighth Tower, and um, even his early book Jadu was was excellent, but. He once suggested, and and um, and I think he I think he said this in uh, uh, Operation Trojan Horse uh, that the UFO phenomenon is actually a staggering cosmic put on. He called it a joke perpetrated by invisible entities who have always delighted in frightening, confusing, and misleading the human race. You have any comments about that? That's pretty provocative, and um, it's a very I think a rather dim view uh, because he's really comparing it to the trouble people would get into regard, you know, fairies and leprechauns and all these, you know, uh, elementals, if they cross them, you know, they, they call them the good people because they were afraid to call them the bad people, you know, in Ireland, you know, so what do you think? Yeah, uh, John Keel, number one, 100%. It's something we should all go back to read, really John Keel and Jacques Vallée side by side. They yeah. can get a very good idea of what's going on. Uh, and Keel is, you know, acerbic and cynical, you know, in his approach to it, which is refreshing. That description that you just read could equally apply to a stage magician, right? That's what they do. They freak you out. They, few, they confuse you. They trick you. Frightening, confusing, and misleading, right? That's what a stage magician is supposed to do. The stage magician is the scientist. The stage magician is cynical. 
the stage magician knows the audience, has a low opinion of the audience, knows that they can be misdirected to look over here when actually everything is taking place over there. That's what a stage magician does. And then you have the real magician, or let's, let's call it the ceremonial magician, the, um, the Doctor Strange magician, okay. This magician is dealing with all of the same effects as the stage magician, except to the ceremonial magician, to the Doctor Strange magician, this is all real stuff that's happening. All of these illusions are real. They're, they're ghosts, they're demons, they're spirits, they're angels, whatever. And there's a manipulation of the basic building blocks of reality that's taking place with that magician. And then there's the stage magician who says, no, that's nonsense. This is what's really happening. It's all a trick. What's happening now is that the stage magician and the Dr. Strange magician are becoming one person, are becoming one entity. And that entity is out there in the sky. That entity is screwing with us. It is at once a nuts and bolts stage magician using misdirection as an almost a form of entertainment. And it's also at the same time, a ceremonial magician who's manipulating our consciousness for some other purpose that we don't understand. Both of these things are happening now. And our scientists are getting closer and closer to this understanding because now we have astronomers like uh, Avi Loeb and other people who are now going and saying, there is something happening out there. Something interstellar passed through that was artificial, that was created, right? They're getting to the point where the religious people who've been going on about this for, for millennia and the scientific people who've been going on about this for not quite as long are now starting to realize they're talking about the same phenomenon. They're talking about the same thing. Right. And they're realizing that this is a magic trick that's taking place. Now, either we can sit there and just be amused by it, entertained by it, and go and watch the movies and you know read the books and all the rest of it, or we can take an extra, a little bit of an extra step and say, what is behind the curtain? Who is doing this? How is this being done? Why are we being frightened and confused? You know, are we frightened and confused because of some problem that we have? Or do we go back to our earlier part of the conversation? Are we alienated because we're aliens? Are we alienated because this is showing us something that we've been trying to put away from ourselves for the last 20, 30,000 years that we don't want to look at, that we don't want to experience, that we don't want to recognize? Something is, is happening. We've been trying to suppress it. And now, as per Jung, perhaps since you brought up Jung and flying saucers, that this is now coming out to the fore. This is now coming in front of us and we're being forced to deal with it. So in a sense, Q was actually, um, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I guess what he was saying is I sort of said what you're saying, you know, it's, it, 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 they're doing this, but there's a reason for them doing this. We don't know what necessarily what the reason is, but it's the same predicament in quantum mechanics, right? If we talk about entanglement or the way particle issue, you know, Schrodinger's cat, uh, I mean, you know, these are the things that I, I think science uh, hasn't really confronted yet, because what it, if it's true and, and it looks to be true, particularly entanglement, my gosh, I mean, what does that actually say? That, that is magic of the highest order, right? And uh, what does that mean? To, what does that mean for us? What does that mean about our reality? And um, um, OK, I, I guess that's what I was getting at. But it was a great answer. I appreciate that. I didn't I would never have thought about the the magician aspect to it, but you're absolutely right. Here's another thing about Keel. Um, he mentioned um, that he thought, uh, you know, or he asked the question really, is if, if he thought that the phenomenon may be reflective. And uh, when he, he stated that uh, the observed manifestations of the UFO phenomena seem to be deliberately tailored and adjusted to the individual beliefs and mental attitudes of the witnesses. And, you know, Jacques Vallée gets into this quite a bit. Both the objects and their occupants appear to be able to adopt a multitude of forms, and the contactees are usually given information that conforms to their own beliefs. Uh, what, what, what are your views on that? I mean, given all the, the, the different, you know, appearances, the major appearances they've, they've, they've had, you know, particularly with large groups where they've shown up. It is reflective. Once again, based on our personal history, we're trying to put this thing in some context that we can understand. Uh, okay. we, we have to clothe it with something. We have to, we have to find, I mean, my first, my first and only experience of a UFO was only a couple of years ago, right? In Florida, and it was in the middle of the night, and it was in December before COVID. And uh, I saw what I thought was a helicopter, a police helicopter hovering, you know, right over 
the car. I mean, I, I stopped the car and looked up, but the helicopter was making no sound, right? And I'm going through, my mind is trying to come up with any possible explanation. The UFO explanation did not occur to me until at the very last second. And I saw the thing just speed off without making a sound at an incredible rate of speed and disappear. I'm thinking to myself, I just saw a UFO. And I've been writing about UFOs for freaking years, right? And there it is. And I'm not, I, I don't see it, right? I don't see it as a UFO. Yeah. So we, we tend to try to come up with explanations for all of this stuff. We clothe in whatever is convenient to us at the time. Now imagine the poor person 200 years ago who couldn't blame it on a police helicopter, right? Now you've got to think something else to blame it on. Well, I'm seeing something in the sky. It's, what is it? It's a person. It's somebody floating. It's, you know, it's swamp gas. It's the planet Venus. It's something, right? Whatever. But eventually they come around to, no, I can't use those explanations. This is not behaving like anything else. And there's no helicopter to blame it on. So you come up with something else. Eyewitness accounts as we know, are notoriously unreliable, right? You can't rely on eyewitness accounts. You, I mean, you can get five eyewitnesses to a crime and they'll tell you five different stories. But one thing will be certain, the crime did take place, right? They all may say, well, it was a short guy, a small guy, a fat woman, a thin woman. It could be, a, you know, different races, different clothing, different whatever, but something happened. We all brought our own consciousness to this. We all saw something a little different from the next person, but we all agree somebody shot somebody else. Somebody else was dead, there's a corpse, right? So there's the corpse that's sitting there and we know it happened. We know that it was there. We just don't, we can't trust all the eyewitnesses, but we can trust the eyewitnesses to know that something happened. And that's what's happening here. We're, we're eyewitnesses at the scene of the crime. And this is, it's a parade of eyewitnesses going back thousands of years but it's all seeing the same phenomenon. It's all seeing the same thing, but giving it a different interpretation, different context. We don't, we don't have any other context to give it. We don't have, we have an alien context now because of Hollywood maybe, but it's still a context. It's something that we're projecting onto this phenomenon. Sure, sure, okay. Well, uh, this other question sort of leads into this. If the UFO phenomenon represents a technology more advanced than our own, well, by how much? and you know, uh, somebody once suggested, uh, and uh, are we looking at 30th century technology when we see these UAPs, or, or perhaps are we experiencing what I like to call a, a, a taste of cosmic consciousness? And you know, and I say this because I'm not sure. Um, I know Jacques Vallée would, would call this. You know, he talks about control mechanisms and it's a, being a technology. And I actually said on television once that I thought it was a, a non non human technology. But when I think about it. Uh, you know, is it really a technology in the sense that it's a nuts and bolts thing, or is it just the ability of something to manipulate reality? And that's the technology, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to look at it, but, but what do you think? Well, it's a lot there to unpack. Um, in ancient and even in present day India, uh, there are the cities, there are certain, there are um, powers that if you practice yoga, you know, for any extended period of time, you get these various powers. This is, they're, they're sort of side effects of the process. And one of them is to see things at a distance or to hear things communicate at a distance, all kinds of things that were considered miraculous 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, which we do now without thinking. We're doing it right now, right? Yeah. You're wherever you are, I'm wherever I am. We're talking to each other. Wouldn't this look like cosmic consciousness to somebody 500 years ago? Wouldn't this look like this is something that is so mind-bending it's impossible to conceive? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a magical power, right? And we use the internet that way. We, we see images on television that way. Uh, all of this that goes on looks like, I mean, it's a trite thing to say, you know, but it's true. If we take a 500, a person from 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, and put them in right now where I'm sitting talking to you, they would lose their minds. They would go insane automatically. They, they could not accommodate. They couldn't fit it inside their brain. It would not happen. So when we're talking about a little bit of cosmic consciousness. My first answer is yes. You know, the phenomenon right away is giving us a little bit of that cosmic consciousness. That's what this is happening. That's what's happening right now. We are seeing something that we cannot fit into our paradigm. We can kind of accommodate it in consciousness, 
because we experience it. It's there now, it's in our brains. If we've seen a UFO, for instance, or UAP, like, like I have to say I did a few years ago, it's there now. I can't get rid of it, right? It's there and it's sitting there like a little thing and it's developing a crust around it, you know? Uh, it can't be digested. I cannot, like, I can't get rid of it. Now, I, I'm kind of hoping maybe there was something at Homestead Air Force Base, not too far from here. They were testing some secret weapon. That would make me feel a little better. But in my heart of hearts, I know that's not. Yeah, no, it's not, no, that's not going to happen, right? That's, yeah. not, that, that's not it. Yeah. So now I know. Now I ha- now I can't digest this. Now I'm screwed. You know, before I was basing my entire work on on UAPs, UFOs, and all of that on the evidence alone, on the documentation. I always said I've never seen a micro, but I know they exist. The same thing with UFOs. Now I can't say that anymore. Now I've actually seen it. What do I do with that now? Right? I go back and I reread everything that I've written, and I try to find does it fit. Does my experience, as, as slight as it was, does it fit? So we are talking about an advanced technology, perhaps 30th century, nah, you know, 21st, maybe 22nd. But we're, we're right up, up against the wall on this now. We're developing artificial intelligence. We have, we have all sorts of technologies, you know, some of which we, the public doesn't really know yet, but which are under development. We know that we're very close to duplicating kind of what the UAPs are doing. We're getting close. And I don't think we're I don't think we're 10 centuries away from that. I think we're really a lot closer than that. Okay. And I think w- when we get there, I think that's where we're going to really begin to understand, you know, what it all is. When we're actually duplicating it and we think to ourselves, oh right, that's that's what it was. Right. Yeah. We're going to get close to the nuts and bolts. The consciousness part is still going to av- avoid us because we're not focused on it. We're focused on the nuts and the bolts. We're focused on the technology. We're not focused on what is probably the the propulsion mechanism for these things, which could be consciousness, right? Yeah. It could be some form of that. And I, that's where we're going to be missing for a while until we really get serious about it in my proposed uh, UAP task force that would include people who, who knew about these things. Yeah. It looks like we're getting past our, our time time limit here. So I had some questions, but I think I'll hold off on those. And I think looks like we'll do, we'll talk to AC uh, and see whether she can, uh, you know, put up a, a fourth a fourth talk, if that's okay with you, Peter. Um, sure. I know you're busy, but um, we're going to have to wrap up this session of TTS Talks now, and we'll be back um, with episode 12, I guess. Um, of TTS Talks uh, with Peter Lavenda, if he, he agrees to this, and I think he will very soon. Peter, again, thank you so much for spending time with us today, and we'll chat with you again soon. And a special thank to our producers, AC Catrone, Kerry DeLong, and Lisa Clifford for all their help and guidance, and without whom this podcast would not be possible. So all of the Secret Machines books are available at tothestars.media. You can stay up to date with TTS by finding us on social media, Instagram at tothestars.media, Twitter at tothestars.media, and Facebook at tothestarsinc. Please subscribe to the podcast, rate and review us over Apple Podcasts, and we will catch you next time for part gosh, four of this uh, series discussing secret machines, gods, man, and war. Bless you all. Thanks, you guys. Nice, nice talking to you again, Peter. Bye-bye.